Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. All right, everyone, thanks for coming. This is a better turnout than I thought, but for Ben Franklin. Um, so Chris teaches in the English department. Are you, are you also part of the Center for Revolution? I am. Okay, so she's the English department and Center for Revolutionary Era Studies. So we're gonna hear about, um, the, did anyone read the autobiography recently? <laughs> Woo-hoo! All right, that's good. Well, maybe after you hear Chris, you might want to read it. But I just finished it. It was good. It was good. Very interesting. Um, and also Judith Sargent Murray, one of the first um, women's rights advocates in America. So Chris is going to tell us about those two um, writers. Arnon from Siena to tell us about. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. It was nice to have somewhere to go on such a rainy day very warm in this library. Um, As Joe said, my name is Chris Farnan, and I teach at Siena College. I am a member of the Center for Revolutionary Era Studies. Um, But the the interesting part about this um, is that I'm not a historian. I'm a literature teacher. One of my areas of interest just happened to be early American literature. Um, which I jokingly refer to all of the books none of the students want to read. Um, So this is actually a text that I teach in my Survey of American Literature course. I have sort of a funny position at Siena College. I'm I'm in the English department, I teach American literature, yet I I sort of have one foot in this center um, for revolutionary era studies. So I, I sort of straddle both areas. Um, Some of my students find that a little confusing. I'll be running a literature class and history students will appear in it. American studies students will appear in it. And they'll wonder what am I doing with these historical texts because I don't teach them as straight historical text. I teach them as literature, an example of American literature. Um, Oftentimes I have English students who complain that I do too much history in my literature classes. Uh, So I I tend to do literature and history and, in the end, make no one happy. So hopefully today um, I can make you a little happy uh, with a little bit of a combination of blend of my studies. Joe already asked, of course, um, who's read this book? I I think we have a winner. Someone got up to page 80. Was that you? (laughs) Uh, I myself stopped at page 82. No, kidding. Uh, I I have read this book many times. Um, I will admit, however, I find uh, the end a little bit of a drop off, understandably, um, as he he completed it pretty much right before he died. So I understand why that is. I want to talk a little bit about the fact that this is an autobiography. What what does it mean for a person to write an autobiography? Um, Has anyone ever considered that? Yes. Why? Why would you have? Ki- why have you considered writing an autobiography? Well, I wanted my grandchildren to know that I had a very interesting life, but I don't get the time to do it, and I'm forgetting more about it. So. <laughs> don't <laughs> don't <laughs> start early. <laughs> okay, uh, that's excellent. You you have had a very interesting life, and the, you want your grandchildren to know. Yes. All right. Okay. So those are those are two very excellent reasons. Um, in fact, Benjamin Franklin starts off his, his autobiography with, the, this, with the, I'm going to call it a premise. Um, yours seems to be very honest. Um, I, I had this life, and I want people to know about it. Benjamin Franklin starts off his autobiography by saying, um, I'm writing this for my son William um, because he needs good advice, and I, I want him to know how to run a good, orderly, uh, decent life so he can be successful. Uh, except when Benjamin Franklin started writing, his son William was already extremely successful. He was royal governor of New Jersey, um, not really seeming in need of um, this type of text. He was a very successful uh, adult man in the, in the pre-revolutionary time period. Um, but it's always a really important to question, 
why does someone write an autobiography? Clearly, Franklin thinks um, his life uh, carried merit. I think his life carried merit. But there's something to be said about the person who sits down. I'm going to write down the story of my life. I, I want people to know how I got where I am. Um, I want this to be carried down for future generations so they, they can learn from uh, my successes, from my mistakes, his errata, right, as he, as he outlines in the text, the mistakes he's made. So I find this very interesting. I find autobiographies in general very interesting. Um, I always ask myself before I start reading them, why is this person writing an autobiography and what does this person want? An autobiography for public consumption is an enormous public statement um, of, of, of a desire for something. Um, every time I finish Franklin's autobiography, I think, so what did he want? And every time I get to the end, I have a new idea <laughs> of, of what he wanted, what he was hoping to achieve um, in the construction of this text. Now, um, as I said, I'm, I'm a, a literature teacher. I teach literature, and I, and I don't just, um, uh, I teach a specific kind of literature. I like to get my, my students into literature in a very specific way. And that is, um, how was this author able to tell this story? Not so much that they told the story, but how are they able to do it? Um, one of my uh, um, chief areas of interest is figuring out how are people able to put the story together um, in a way to make it interesting to the reader and to get across whatever their argument is. Uh, generally, when you read an autobiography, there's an argument behind it. Someone is making an argument, and they're trying to convince the reader that their take on the argument is, is the correct take. Right? Um, I also find it very interesting reading pre-revolutionary or colonial era um, autobiographies or stories of those uh, American lives um, because the narrative choices the means or the methods by which authors had available to them were somewhat restricted. A number of times I'll be teaching uh, early American literature and my students will say, oh, we're so sick of William Bradford and Plymouth Plantation. We're so sick of Cotton Mather. <laughs> we're, so, we're so sick of John Criff Cure and his letters to the American farmer. Can't we read something else? And my answer is, no, you cannot, <laughs> because we're reading what there is. Um, one of the benefits of teaching early American literature is you could pretty much cover all of it. There's not that much. Um, but one of the downsides is you find that you're, you're repeating yourself over and over in classes, and students are saying, we heard this. Um, what I think is really interesting about Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is how he takes advantage of the narrative strategies that already existed when he started writing his autobiography in 1777, I think he starts, right? That he's already taking advantage of, of narrative strategies that members of what we now call the United States of America were familiar with, right? I'm familiar with this method of storytelling. I've heard this story before. Um, I'm familiar with this form that you're using. Somewhere I've heard this form before. Um, and one of my arguments is about the argument he's making in this book is that he uses two forms of narration, of narrative, that his readers are already going to be familiar with. So they're, they're going to be more likely to believe his argument, agree with what he says, because the form he's using is so familiar. All right. So the first form is that of the early American travel narrative, um, the journey of the hero or the character to someplace new and unfamiliar, the conquering of obstacles, um, mistakes strewn in the hero's path, which he conquers and rectifies and moves on. This is a familiar story already to his audience. Um, this is referred to as like sort of the quintessential American book. 
Um, and Benjamin Franklin is the quintessential American. But when he wrote this book, there was no such thing. There was no such thing as a quintessential American book. And there was barely such a thing as America, let alone a book or a quintessential American. So he, he uses a form that's already been established, and that is of person traveling to what I'm going to call the new world in order to change and transform both that world and himself in the process. All right? And that's, that's what happens. That's how he presents what's happens in the text. So let me just talk a little bit about why, during that time period, people would already be familiar with this story. Now, when I start teaching a survey of American literature, I begin with the letters of Christopher Columbus. Right? Start right with the letters of Christopher Columbus. Um, I start with the letters he writes back to Isabel and Ferdinand in Spain. Hey, here I am. <laughs> Made it to uh, an island off of mainland China. That's what he writes back. Um, I'm there. I'm going to meet Genghis Khan any day now. Um, and uh, this is what I see. Uh, this is how I'm interpreting the world around me. And please send more money. All right? So. These are, these are how his, his letters really run, back to the king and queen. Based on these letters, uh, he, Christopher Columbus established uh, a literary genre, the early American travel narrative. And there are specifics to, to this genre. And one of them is uh, traveling from the old world to the new world. Old, tired, European world, corrupt, full of vice, Dear God, those Catholics, right? Have to get away from them, flee, you know, to somewhere else. Um, and it usually involves a very difficult ocean journey. Right? So this begins with, with Christopher Columbus. His letters detail this difficult ocean journey. Now, I argue that in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, he, he just puts a little twist on this. There is a journey, very famous journey in this text. But it's not from Europe to uh, southern regions of North America, and it's not from Europe to Massachusetts. It's from Boston to Philadelphia. But by God, how long does it take him to get there? Right? How long are we on that boat? We row and we row with them, don't we? And Benjamin Franklin has to work, and he's ill, and he's sick, and he practically washes up on the shores of Philadelphia, destitute, nearly starving, so little money in his pocket. All right, so it's very, the effort involved is already following a very specific, familiar story. It takes a lot of physical work to get there. All right, so let alone the, the mind issues, all right? We haven't, he hasn't even really started about how intelligent he is yet. It's the physical labor involved, all right? We see this in Christopher Columbus. It's grueling. Uh, another 50 years later, we're going to see this in a story by a very famous Spaniard in his time period, whose last name was de Vaca, um, who was very loosely connected to Cortez, who travels to the New World to take, seek his fortune, and is washed up on the shores of, of Texas and Galveston, um, and has this horrific ocean journey. Um, I won't, uh, and of course, it's, it's, a, it's a much more disgusting story than this, involving eating rotten horse meat, and uh, there's lots of death and destruction involved. Um, but again, it's this arduous journey, which there's suffering, physical hardship, there's danger involved. All right, so again, the American public, familiar with this story, even, even in the time period when Franklin is writing. Um, the story that they're most familiar, though, however, and if you were here for the, um, the piece last year on the Mayflower, is, is the story of the Pilgrims. Uh, the Pilgrims' Journey, William Bradford's story of Plymouth Plantation is, again, this narrative of the American travel, right? The American journey, the, the American travel narrative, um, going from the old world to the new world brutal, unbelievable hardship in the crossing of the Atlantic, the pilgrims practically staggering out of the ship at the end of it, dying, thirsty, starving, um, so grateful to be on the shore that they're literally kissing the ground when they get out of the boat. They're so happy that they have made it this far. Um, 
Benjamin Franklin creates his story in those narrative paths that have already been laid out. So when, when the reader is with him, when his contemporary reader is with him in the boat, rowing to Philadelphia, um, he, he already has the audience moving along with him. Yes, this is how the story goes. This is familiar. Right? So when Benjamin Franklin's writing, there was no such thing yet as rags to riches. There's no such thing yet as Horatio Alger. Um, but what did exist was incredible, brutal physical exertion. Now, does Benjamin Franklin really have such a brutal voyage <laughs> from Boston to Philadelphia? Not so much. <laughs> um, he gets a little thirsty. I think he, he gets dehydrated at one point and has to drink a lot of water. Um, but when he, when he comes out of the ship at the end, it's like, hello, Philadelphia, right? And we have the very famous scenario where he's got the, he buys the, um, he buys the puffy bread um, uh, when he arrives and he, and he walks along. And this is, on, um, this is on page 22 if you want to take a look at your, at your book later. Um, he's so happy to have arrived. And as he says when he gets off the boat, I walked toward the top of the street, gazing about till near Market Street when I met a boy with bread. And, and this is the mark of his great glorious entrance as a 19-year-old into Philadelphia. Um, I had often made a meal of dry bread, inquiring where he bought it. I went immediately to the baker's he directed me to. I asked for biscuits, meaning such as we had at Boston, that sort, it seems, were not made at Philadelphia. I then asked for a free three-penny loaf and was told they had none. Not knowing the different prices nor the names of the different sorts of bread, I told him to give me three penny worth of any sort. He gave me accordingly three great puffy rolls. I was surprised at the quantity, but took it, and having no room in my pockets, walked off with a roll under each arm and eating the other. All right, so we have this great image of Franklin with the bread under his arms while he's eating one. All right, and he, and he sort of mocks himself um, from his, uh, you know, adult, mature, man of the world perspective. Oh, what a crazy kid I was, right? Walking up and down the streets of Philadelphia with this bread under my arms. But what he's really done here is he's smart, you know, I made it, I got here, I'm already a success. Now, if the difficult passage is one part of the narrative that he slightly skewers uh, to use for his own storytelling, um, there are other markers of the early American travel narrative. One of them is, uh, what I call the catalog, and this is how I refer to it my students. Um, old world explorers, when coming to the new world, um, one of the things they would immediately do when writing back, either to, uh, usually to nobles who have funded their, their expedition, or letters of desperation and horror um, as to, you know, we're here, um, we've made it, but the mosquitoes are attacking. <laughs> um, we have uh, something called the catalog, and this is a list that explorers made of the wonders and the splendors of the new world. Um, a list of all the wonders that can be found. Christopher Columbus's letters in particular, I find incredibly heartwarming um, when he writes about the glories of what he's seen, the flora, the fauna, um, the incredible beauty of the trees, the birds, the ground. You know, the Christopher Columbus is just in awe. He, he, he's in such awe when he arrives. He thinks he's found Eden. He thinks he's actually found, you know, the paradise, you know, where Adam and Eve came from. And what, what Benjamin Franklin does is he catalogs the beauties and the wonders of Philadelphia. The streets, the shops, the food that's available, the kindliness of the people who greet him. Um, we, we come with two or three pages outlining all these wonderful people that he meets, and then he nods off safely for a nap in a Quaker meeting. Right? He says, you know, the, my first nap, my first sound sleep I had was in a Quaker meeting house. Uh, but he really does provide the reader with this catalog, um, not only of um, non-living, items, uh, the docks, the streets, the houses, the shops, the food, but the people, 
the people are so welcoming. And this is another part of the, the travel narrative as well um, that Christopher Columbus used, that Devaki uses, um, that while some people are unfriendly, but most persons who I've encountered on this journey so excellent sense and understanding what a great person I am. And again, this is part of the travel narrative. Um, the story of uh, conquering a new portion of the world um, and changing it for the better, changing yourself for the better as well. All right, now, um, something else I want to talk about too in terms of this particular narrative form. One of the one of the more interesting modes of that type of storytelling, comparing the old world to the new world through this journey, that Benjamin Franklin hits on is comparing virtues and vices. Um, <laughs> there's a lot about virtue and vice in this text, um, that he compares virtue and vices. And the, the first one he starts with, and I think this is really interesting, is idleness. Um, it takes a lot of energy to make a journey like this. It takes a lot of inspiration and self-motivation to undertake an accomplishment like this. And once he gets to Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin, I like to say, really hits his stride and his narrative by talking about industry, thrift, um, uh, his, his attempt to um, turn away from dissipation, drink, idleness, wasting time. Um, he really focuses, and this is very much part of that narrative tradition, and, and it very deeply reminds me of William Bradford's Plymouth Plantation, um, that New England hardiness, that thriftiness, that work ethic, um, that these are the means by which one accomplishes what Benjamin Franklin is, is putting together in this text, the American dream. Um, people might not have called it that before Benjamin Franklin, but they're going to call it that after Benjamin Franklin as he, as he takes sort of like these other narratives and kind of pushes them together in a ball and then sort of rolls it back out for the reader, right? So we have this great attention to these virtues in the, in the text. Um, and I'm going to give you, a, let me just read you a couple examples. I love his criticism of everyone else's drinking habits. Should you love that? I, I love it when he, I mean, these are, I, so it tells you a lot about me, doesn't it? But I, I really love reading these passages. Oh, they, they, all they do is drink beer. All they do is drink beer. And I remember the first time I read this and I'm thinking, well, didn't everyone drink beer? Wasn't the water really unhealthy? Like, I, I, I remember learning that in second grade, or even colonial children drink beer, right? I mean, oh, as an eight, you know, an eight year old, really? Um, but uh, he has this, um, he has these great passages about how much you can accomplish if you don't drink. Uh, who knew? Um, on page 42, he says, at my first admission into the printing house, I took to working at press, imagining I felt a want of bodily exercise I had been used to in America, where press work is mixed with the composing. Um, he, and he chooses the harder work. I need more exercise. Right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some press work along with composing. Um, I think I'm getting a little weak. I drank only water. The other workmen, near 50 in number, were great drinkers of beer. On occasion, I carried up and down stairs a large form of type in each hand when others carried but one in both hands. All right, so automatically we're being informed it's because it's I drink water, not beer. I'm stronger. I can carry twice the weight. They wondered to see from this in several distances that the water American, as they called me, was stronger than themselves who drank strong beer. We had an alehouse boy who attended always in the house to supply the workmen. My companion at the press drank every day a pint before breakfast, a pint at breakfast, a pint between breakfast and dinner, a pint at dinner, a pint in the afternoon about six o'clock, and another pint when he had done his day's work. He says that. Yeah, I know. He says that. What a waste of money. Um, I thought it a detestable custom. But it was necessary, he supposed, to drink strong beer that he might be strong to labor. I endeavored to convince him that the bodily strength afforded by beer could only be in proportion to the grain or flour of the barley dissolved in water in which it was made. I love this argument. Isn't that great? You really should just eat bread. 
<laughs> right? Right? Liquid, liquid bread is not bread. Um, therefore, if he could eat that with a pint of water, it would give him more strength. So I, I, love, I love this passage because it really does show me, when I read this, that he really is adhering to this, this narrative. Um, boy goes west. Okay, it's only Philadelphia. But at the time, you know, that's, that's a, a, a deep uh, trip into the continent. Um, uh, boy begins a life of thrift and industry, and then on a trip to London, he's carrying these new water American virtues back to England. All right, so I mean, he's already continuing the narrative. I mean, he he he's already gone back to the old world uh, with his thrift and his industry. Um, so he's really making kind of a nice little circle about this narrative. All right, we're fixing these lax European values, and then we're going to bring back these new energetic ways. All right, so now you can see how, for the reader, this is most appealing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Follows the same narrative path, same story. Um, uh, travel in the new world or travel to the new world vastly improves one char one's character and then one spreads this character improvement upon others. Very American, right? Very American. I mean, we, we love sharing our good character, right? And pressing the importance of our good character. Um, and then as... Um, as someone already pointed out, uh, Benjamin Franklin talks about how he has to pay four or five shillings every week for this beer, which is an enormous amount of money. Right? That's a lot of money to be spending a beer. And I love Franklin's final line, and thus these poor devils keep themselves always under, right? Under economically, um, under in achieving uh, what they could achieve um, if they only paid attention to their own self-worth, their own self-value, and, and achieve their potential. Um, so he, he works on that. Um, I also like it when he turns to food. Um, he becomes quite abstemious with his, with his uh, eating habits, um, which, uh, uh, which were perceived as incredibly strange. For a while, he gives up meat. Um, he starts uh, refusing to eat only but the, the smallest portions. He says he has more energy when he eats less. And this is, this is viewed as very strange. Um, but this is one of his arguments. Um, that drinking less and eating less boost his industry, his boost of industry boosts his virtue. All right, so with everything with Franklin, it's a step, it's a step, it's a step, but it's constant. And I, I really appreciate how in this text, he takes us with him. It, it's a really fascinating combination of, he's using a narrative form that his readers are familiar with to write his story, yet he draws us into it because he does it so gradually, right? So his form really matches his content in this text. Um, he, he, he refuses to eat beer and bread and cheese for breakfast. Uh, he thinks this is too heavy, bogs down the body, bogs down the brain. Um, and instead, he prefers hot water gruel. Has anyone here ever enjoyed hot water gruel? Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not really sure what that is, to tell you the truth. I, I always envision hot water gruel as um, you take the little packet of, of Quaker, right, the little instant oatmeal packet, and you open it. But you know how you're only supposed to add it to like a cup of water? I'm envisioning like that going into a whole pot. Just the one packet, and then you get a scoop. It doesn't sound very good, does it? No, hot water gruel. I don't even like the word gruel. Um, and he talked about how you know they save money in this way, um, increasing increasing thrift. And they're more energetic, increasing industry. Right? Um, and of course, all this ties into what is really Franklin's uh, ulterior motive. Um, and in answering one of the questions that I, I ask at the beginning of this text, what does he want? What does Franklin want? What is he looking for when he writes this? Um, he, you know, we've been told over and over in his letters, oh, I only wrote this autobiography because my friends made me. My friends are making me do this. But he tells us in this book, you know what's a good idea? If you have a good idea, don't say it's yours. Say it's your friend's idea. Because then people will agree with you, and they'll go along with you. And then you don't act like a show-off or a bragger, and then people will be like on your team. But then he does it to us in the text. Oh, this wasn't my idea to write this book. 
My friends are clamoring for it. They say it's necessary. I wouldn't do it if it weren't for my friends. But he tells us in the book that this is one of his methods of convincing people to do what he wants. So it's, it's, it's very interesting at the end of his life. Is, is he the magician giving away the secret? Or is he sort of kind of laughing? Huh? Guess what I did my whole life? Now I'm doing it to you, right? As we read along in the text. Um, but he talks a lot about his public image in this text, that he carefully crafts a public image. After the Revolutionary War, Benjamin Franklin was the most famous person in the world. In the world. The, not just the most famous American, the most famous person. His, his figure and face were more recognizable than any of the, 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 the kings and queens still remaining in Europe, and he was more recognizable than George Washington. And he crafted that. He honed that. He was his own PR machine. Um, I'm going to read you a little excerpt. In, um, this is on the bottom of page 62. Uh, he's back in Philadelphia. Um, he's gone through a number of uh, business ventures, opening a store, opening a stationery shop, um, moving kind of between journals and newspapers. He's starting to put his hand a little bit into very minor, very local politics. Um, nothing outrageous. He's already begun his um, really intriguing self-improvement group where he meets with his friends and they read great literature and debate with each other. Um, if only 22-year-old young men did that nowadays, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, break for laughter, right? Okay. Um, this on page 62. I, I began now gradually to pay off the debt I was under for the printing house. Smart, paying off his debt. In order to secure my credit and character as a tradesman, I took care of not only to be in reality industrious and frugal, but to avoid the appearance of the contrary. And this, this is a fascinating paragraph because he says, I am very industri industrious. I work really hard. But even when I'm not working, I, I make it look like I'm still working, which is a, a really fascinating idea. I dressed plain and was seen at no places of idle diversion. I never went out fishing or shooting. A book indeed sometimes debauched me from my work, but that was seldom, was private and gave no scandal. Right? So he's, he's telling us, the closest I came to debauchery was reading, but that was in private. Right? So, um, I sometimes brought home the paper I purchased at the stores through the streets on a wheelbarrow. And, and again, this is it's the second fam most famous scene from this text, aside from the puffy roll scene where he walks into Philadelphia with the rolls under his arms, that he made sure people in Philadelphia saw him pushing his own wheelbarrow. I do my own work. And of course, he has men under him who, who, who has hired, who could very well accomplish this form, but he wants to be seen pushing the wheelbarrow. Right? Thus being esteemed an industrious, thriving young man and paying duly for what I bought, the merchants who imported stationery solicited my custom. Others proposed supplying me with books and I went on prosperously. All right, he knows this is the way people are looking out their doors and their windows. People are watching him. Hey, look, there goes young Franklin. He works all the time, that man, all the time, all right? In good stead, good reputation, improved business, more money, all right? He doesn't make a step in this book that does not end in profit. Very clever, very clever. Um, now, if, if the form, if the narrative form is familiar, I do have to say the benefit, another benefit of using this type of storytelling, this type of storytelling that's going to remind people of stories they've already heard, is because the character is different. Now, like I said, this isn't rags to riches. Benjamin Franklin was not living in poverty in Boston. Um, Benjamin Franklin, um, however, um, was not of noble birth. Um, his family was lower middle class. Uh, he was, in terms of 
uh, European ideas of uh, inheritance or importance in the family line, not just the youngest son in his own family, but the youngest son of a long line of youngest sons stretching back into England. Uh, really, in the right and proper scheme of things, uh, under European influence in the 17th century, he didn't have a chance in the world. He wasn't going to get any, any money or any support from his family. The difference about this story is the position of the character at the beginning. This isn't Christopher Columbus loaded with money by, with Ferdinand and Isabel uh, sent overseas. Um, e even the pilgrims actually had significant financial backing. Uh, the disaster shock, you know, when they hit Cape Cod and realized Cape Cod in December isn't exactly pleasant. Um, but uh, Benjamin Franklin's story really is unique in that he is a person um, who may not have come out of, of poverty, but established himself as the most significant man in the world during his time who came from complete insignificance. That is the difficulty in this text, which is why he needs the familiar storytelling lines. Right? If you're going to create this unusual character that people haven't come up against before, you, you have to explain that character through familiar storytelling lines. Or else it's, you can't, it's not possible for the audience to comprehend it. It's too different. It's too strange. All right, so he's able to accomplish this um, incredibly well. All right. Now, so I talked about the travel narrative. Uh, there's one other narrative I want to hit on, which I, and, and it's, it'll, uh, it'll be a little quicker as I go through this. Um, how many times in this book, if you've read it, does Benjamin Franklin complain about all the sermons he had to listen to when he was a kid? He complains about this all the time. There's a lot about religion in this text, actually. Um, but what's in this text about religion isn't dogma, and it isn't theory. It's complaints about dogma and theory. I'm not going to sit there and listen to a minister talk about dogma to me. That doesn't have anything to do with my everyday life. I'm not going to listen to it. My father made me do that, and I'm not going to do it. But the fact of the matter is, he's obviously very deeply influenced by the sermons he listened to by Calvinist ministers in the churches in Boston when he was a child. Because, in a way, he models the entire book after a Calvinist sermon. All right, now, let me just talk a little bit about the structure of the Calvinist sermon. All right. Um, please. Uh, I was going to say this a long time ago. Sure. That uh, I, from what I have read, and I have not read this book, I totally confess that I have read books on Benjamin Franklin, but not that one. I really do feel that he was, a lot of what he wrote mm -hmm. was religious, mm -hmm. and that his group meetings with people were to, to build a strong religious background for himself and them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, and although you've emphasized that he did a lot of things to show himself mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. I really think that that's, that's uncomfortable for me because mm -hmm. I feel like his principles were not, um, he wasn't out to, to be Mr. Big. I think, I think he was out uh, to um, better himself, mm -hmm. to make himself a better person. He may have wanted people to think positively of himself, but I think his, his strongest motivation was to Ooh. And I really wanted to say that a lot. No, I'm glad that you did. I, I actually think those two things go hand in hand. Um, I, I think that he had such a tightly intertwined motivation to better himself and to be seen as that bettered person. I don't think you can separate them. OK. <laughs> because yeah. I, I felt a little uncomfortable, like, like perhaps he was being a bit of a phone. He was trying to show off. I think, I I think, think as he writes the book, He's, as he writes the book, there is a tone in it where he's saying to the reader, do you see what I did? But I don't think he's saying it as, I was a phony or I faked it. I think he's saying, the appearance of industry leads to industry. The appearance of morality leads to morality. Oh, OK. That, that these, but I also think he had a very good sense of humor. 
very good sense of humor. I think a lot of this book is very funny. I think the comments he makes about the drinking, I think the comments he makes about himself are very humorous and very funny. I think he has an excellent sense of humor. And I think that is what shows through the end where he's looking back at us and he, he recognizes what he has done and what he's doing in writing an autobiography. And I think it's a little tongue in cheek. Um, when I said at the beginning, you know, he, he says, like, I'm writing this for my son. And I said, well, his son happened to be very successful and didn't necessarily need this. That's another narrative style where you, you say, well, I wouldn't do this, but. Um, and he's, I think that's where he falls into, he's being a little wry. A little, yeah, Just sure. One last comment. Not no, keep going. going. Anymore, and that is um, his son who was working for the British government. And I think even at the time that he was appointed to mm -hmm. governor or whatever mm -hmm. he was, um, Franklin thought that was a bad idea because Franklin had turned from pro-British mm -hmm. to pro -American. And, and, and he said, you're absolutely. Failed. And, and eventually, I think he did. It's, it's rather astounding. Um, there's a book out right now that I haven't read called um, The First American Civil War, and it's about the revolution. Um, and I have not read this book. Has anyone else read this book? But I do know that Franklin and his son William are key players in it because they, they split. Um, when, when Franklin begins this book, he views himself as a citizen of the British throne. You know, I'm, I'm a British subject when he begins this book. Um, when he's about... 70 pages in, I think, at the end of the first part. Um, by the time he starts writing again, the revolution has happened and he has changed sides. And not only um, did his son fall into the other side of the line, but um, his son was primarily responsible for the execution of Joshua Huddle, if that, rings, if that name rings any bells. Um, his son actually ordered the execution of a revolutionary patriot, um, which resulted in a resurgence of um, men enlisting to fight for the Continental Army. Um, and much is made of William Franklin's decision to execute uh, this one patriot um, at the direct opposition of his father's wishes. So it's, it is a really interesting uh, dynamic that happens there. But you might be interested in that. Um, also, um, I know that Joe had said earlier that we're going to have a, a speaker come to Siena, and her name is Sheila Skemp, and she's going to be at Siena College on April 4th, and she is a national historian, and her specialty is uh, Benjamin Franklin, but not only Benjamin Franklin, his son William. And she's working on a she published a book already, and it's about William Franklin. It's called William Franklin, Son of a Patriot, Servant of a King, um, which you'd probably be very interested in. Um, but there's, there's literature on the table in the back of the room next to the delicious cookies, um, uh, which will outline what Sheila Scamp is going to be talking about. Um, and it's, it's Monday, April 4th. There's going to be a book signing and a lecture. Um, and she's going to give a lecture called A World We Have Lost, Benjamin Franklin and the American Dream, which sounds really interesting. And we are hoping that you all come and attend this at Santa College on April 4th. And there's plenty of flyers in the back of the room as well. So just to, to pick up where we left off with the sermon idea, um, I think that this book is very much a sermon. And I think what Benjamin Franklin did with the course of his life is he created a new way of converting to a belief in God. And it's, it's not the way uh, one did as a child when he was a child in Boston through the conversion process um, in, the, uh, in the church, which involved um, a public narrative of how one came to grace, public story in church where you have to get up and talk about how you found God and you came to, to grace and you have to tell a very specific narrative. And that narrative would have to come with a full confession of sin, an explanation of your humiliation once you realized you lived enmeshed in this sin, your means of overcoming and renouncing it and trying to lead um, a, a life one with God. Now, in this text, Benjamin Franklin has... Um, a very famous chart, um, which um, you will find, um, it's between pages 71 and 73, um, in which he makes a, a list of his own virtues, 
um, which some of them are very close to, to Calvinist virtues, particularly thrift and moderation. And then he has this great chart where he keeps track on a daily basis of how close he comes to uh, meaning perfection in those virtues. I love a chart. I love anything with a chart. Um, and of course, this was also uh, the bane of many a mid 19th century schoolboy whose father made him read this book. And, and I've read letters and diaries of uh, famous uh, early 20th century politicians who, who had to make the chart as a child and, and keep track of, of their virtues and how they did throughout the day. Um, but he, he makes his own uh, chart here. Um, and what they really boil down to are three main virtues um, that the reader is going to recognize. They might not sound what they heard in churches in New England in their own childhoods, but it's going to be close enough. And that is um, truth, sincerity, and integrity. That these are the main virtues by which one must live in order to achieve grace. And it has nothing to do with formal worship or organized religion. And he spars back and forth with a number of ministers in this text. Um, I love it when he goes and he sits through a sermon and he's really angry and he's really bored and, and he's miserable and then he gives the minister money anyway um, because he signed up and he said he would and he's all like frustrated. Um, I, I think those are great scenes, but that these are, for the most important, these are significant themes throughout the entire text. Sincerity, integrity, um, and truth. And I think that the, the vice that Benjamin Franklin struggled with so mightily throughout his entire life was vanity. And I think that's part of the, the wink we're getting here. Like, I recognize, I recognize that, you know, I, I had some of this vice. Um, he tells a wonderful story in this text uh, where he meets, uh, uh, he meets a woman who wanted to be a Catholic nun. Um, and I can't remember why, but she wasn't allowed to. And so she spends the rest of her life secluded in her own apartment, um, praying and, and trying to live a godly life. And a priest comes every day and hears her confession. And Benjamin Franklin says to her, what do you have to confess? You know, you, you, you live this incredibly structured, orderly, kind life. You, 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 and it was the woman who lived upstairs, right? The landlady, like, what could she have to confess? Oh no, he he does he does get a conversation with her. The woman invites her up to the apartment. Right, but I don't think I, yeah. My understanding or recall was he didn't okay, ask then. her. He asked the landlady, and she said, "What does she say?" The, 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 what your thoughts? The vain thoughts. The she vain said thoughts. it's very hard to avoid vain thoughts because even though she's in this, she separated herself from the world. It's hard for her not to think, "Oh, I'm a really good person." because I'm doing this. And I think he recognized that. It's very, and, and I think that's, that's why it's in the text, that he, he recognizes this. Um, and uh, again, so he's delivering a sermon that's very familiar to, to the people who, who have access to it. Um, they understand the travel narrative. They understand the sermon narrative. Um, they, can, uh, they, can, they can sympathize with this, if not fully understand it. Um, and then, because he's got the audience so drawn in, he lets them be then inspired by what he's accomplished. I mean, really, has anyone accomplished more than Benjamin Franklin? Do we have anyone since Benjamin Franklin who's, who's, who's done as much as Benjamin Franklin did? And I really think uh, he, he presents himself as a human being. You know, he lists his errors. Um, well, that was a mistake. Well, I lent Ralph money. And it wasn't even my money, it was my brother Vernon's money. And then he, he spent it on a girl in London. <laughs> and he wouldn't pay it back. Oh, don't lend your friend's money. Right? I mean, he, he, he oh, that was a mistake. Um, oh, shoot, I forgot to write to Miss Reed. Oh, that was a big mistake. I really liked this girl, and I left her in Philadelphia, and I didn't write her. And then he goes back to America, and he's mortified because he sees her. Oh, I didn't, oh, there's the girl I didn't write. Oh, don't look at me. Right? He's so embarrassed. So he, 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 he talks about these human errors that he makes. Of course, he winds up marrying her anyway. But you know, he talks about these human mistakes, these human errors that he makes along the way. And it makes it a friendlier sermon. It makes it something that real regular people could attempt to accomplish. Um, and he makes some big mistakes. Uh, uh, when, when he's in London, I mean, he's, 
he enters into interesting relationships. Um, when he's a diplomat in France after the revolution, he enters into other interesting relationships. I mean, he makes mistakes, but it, he, he, he acknowledges them. And you can tell he's sort of weighing them against the good that he's achieved. Yes, sir? Uh, I've read other commentaries of his uh, sure. time in France, yeah. uh, Cher Papa. And th those commentaries seem to feel that he was playing a role mm -hmm. and very successful at it. Uh, the hat. Skin hat mm -hmm. or yeah. fur hat. He was a celebrity. Cher Papa, yeah. uh, womanizer. Yeah, he was. Um, he was a celebrity in France, and he and he and he and he used it. Um, exactly. It he, wasn't a he, mistake. He adorns a. He he adorns a costume. Well, I think I think the mistake I'm I'm thinking about was the. Some of the, I think he felt that he didn't really need to enter into those relationships. Perhaps he could have just pretended. But he, you know, he he a costume when he goes to France. He wears a coonskin hat. He didn't wear a coonskin hat in America, right? It's it's he's, he was playing a role. You want me to be like a a, a buckskin hero? That's what I'll be for you. Um, please deplete your treasury. Give it to us. You know, I mean, and he's and look how successful he is. I mean, he was masterful. He was very masterful at it. Um, Let's see. So we did travel narrative, sermon narrative, um, very familiar. And, and in such, this is now an incredibly familiar story. Even, even for people who haven't read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, you, you pretty much know what it's about. Work hard, work harder, don't eat too much, don't drink too much, play your, play your business cards close to your vest, save money, and you'll do well. And then you're very American, isn't it? Right? Isn't that sort of the American dream? Work hard and you can accomplish anything. Um, and again, like I said, that's what Sheila Scamp is going to be talking about on April 4th. All right, now, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the, other, um, the other writer at the time, Judith Sargent Murray. But before I move on to Judith Sargent Murray, does anyone want to talk about Benjamin Franklin some more? I just wanted to mention, I don't believe the charts in this book. I looked, mm -hmm. and. Uh, just, I think it's curious. I, maybe it was just prevented, uh, presented verbally, but the chart you mentioned on 71 or whatever it doesn't seem to be in the new version. So oh. if anybody's looking for it, oh, I'm sorry, don't look too long or too hard. <laughs> OK. Well, maybe I'll take, let me take a look at your book afterwards. Maybe um, it gets stuck in an appendix. Um, I have an anthology with all his writings in it at home. And in that anthology, it's actually in the back. So let me take a look. Yes, sir. Was there a uh, biography popular in those days? Um, there was something called the spiritual biography or the spiritual autobiography um, that were relatively popular, but not um, there weren't very many autobiography or biographies of living contemporary American figures. Um, so the reading that Benjamin Franklin did in the form of biography or autobiography were primarily European. Um, but there was a genre called the spiritual autobiography uh, that was very popular. I think Cotton Mather wrote one. And it was all about one's relationship with God throughout one's life. They're tough reading. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I haven't finished the book, and I don't know that much about Franklin, but I did hear about his relationships with other women. Were they strictly family relationships, or were they more than that? It's funny how everyone's always so interested. <laughs> um, he, he did have a number of dalliances in Europe um, after he was married. Uh, his son, William, who became the, the governor of New Jersey, was illegitimate. Um, that was not Deborah Reed's child. Um, so he did have a, a number of, of relationships. However, um, it, it is interesting uh, to see Benjamin Franklin in terms of uh, a, a human. I mean, he was a human being. Um, he, doesn't, he, he includes some of his earlier misadventures in the autobiography. Um, he doesn't include his later ones. You'll notice that it ends rather abruptly. You also notice after you make your way through the whole book, um, the narrative changes um, very uh, distinctly. Um, he does not use that same narrative structure throughout the whole book. Um, once he starts talking about the American Revolution, it's as though you're reading a history textbook. 
Um, it's very different. It's a very different method of writing. It's very objective. And the beginning of the book is very subjective as an autobiography. Um, when he moves on to recording um, his role in the French and Indian War, War and his role in London immediately prior to the Revolutionary War, it's, it's very factual. Um, the, even the sentences are shorter. The paragraphs are shorter. Um, it's very much reading like a history guidebook. Um, so he does not reveal nearly as much personal information about himself. Would you say anything? Mm -hmm. I this, uh, comment sure. that I really think, uh, if you look back at the uh, traditions, the, the, the way that people were living in France mm -hmm. when Franklin went over there, I think, yeah, he fell into that, mm -hmm. but he fell into what every, well, I shouldn't say everybody was doing, but a lot of people were doing. It was not as if he was doing something unusual. And I, I read about other uh, people who were sent to France to be. Um, uh, from the United States to, to be uh, uh, diplomats mm -hmm. or more or to get money, basically. Sure. And they failed, and he did not fail. And I think uh, you have to you have to kind of look at it as as what was going on in France mm -hmm. at the time. I I don't shall we say I don't excuse it, but I understand that he was living the way they were. Living. And you know what's very interesting. Um, after the, the um, I'm trying to think of what year this was published. I think it was 1788. Uh, one of the first plays in America came out, the first play in America, that was written by an American playwright, acted by American authors, and produced by Americans on the American stage. And it was called The Contrast. And it was by a man named Royal Tyler, who actually wanted to marry John Adams' daughter, Navi. And John Adams would not let his daughter marry this ridiculous, penniless playwright. Um, uh, so he, he like broke off their marriage. We had this very, you know, sort of dramatic teenage life. I uh, sort of crushed that he was never able to marry Nabby Adams. But he wrote this play called The Contrast. And in the play, it's very much along the lines of um, New World Virtue, Old War, or Old World uh, Vice. And uh, in the play, it's set in New York City immediately following the Revolutionary War, and it's very much a social comedy, uh, like a drawing room comedy. Uh, there's male characters and female characters, um, and there are very giddy, flirtatious girls, and there are very scandalous, um, dissipated young men. And they've all been corrupted by Europe because their parents send them on tours of Europe and they're ruined. And then they come back to America like bad apples and they rot the rest of the barrel. Um, and, and it's this really fascinating idea. Um, you know, uh, after the revolution, it, all right, we got to close the country down. Uh, y Europe is completely rotten. Um, they're corrupt. Uh, the vice, they're riddled with vice. We're going to close the country down. Uh, and of course, that's the beginnings of uh, early isolationism. But it's deeply tied to morality. Um, but there's a character in, uh, in the contrast that is the young version of Benjamin Franklin. And I, I wish I could remember his name. It's like Colonel Manley. It is Manley. It's Colonel Manley, now that I think about it. His name is Colonel Manley. And he fought in the Revolutionary War, and he refuses to take off his officer's jacket from the Revolutionary War. And his, and his sister says things like, um, Oh, take off that nasty jacket and buy something fashionable. And he talks about the honor it is to wear this coat and how he will never spend a dime to improve, you know, his his uh, his apparel when um, you know fields need to be sown and crops need to be harvested and hard work has been done. And it's very much that of of the young Franklin, the thrifty, uh, the industrious young man who fought for his country and spends every moment that he's not working hard um, studying. And in intellectual conversation and seeking the right woman to marry, um, but it's it, it's a very interesting thing that happens uh, following uh, the conclusion of uh, the diploma, diplomatic trends in 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 France and in England, and then a severing between our country and Europe that lasted for a considerable period of time. I don't remember what the question was anymore. Why I'm even talking about that? But <laughs> does anybody have any other questions? Again, I thank you so much for having me here today. I really had a good time.